created Jay-Z a long time ago. Um, yeah! Um, and uh, basically then after that came back and set up a studio Rocketworks in Dunedin in New Zealand. So this part of, this part of the world. So we, we, we really wanted to do this panel to sort of discuss where uh, one of the games we're working on at the studio station has came from and particularly take a lot of questions. One of the things we're revealing here is our work on uh, motherships. So basically, when we started off with Stationeers, we really wanted to make a building game, kind of like, who, who plays Space Engineers here? You people? Yeah. So we played a lot of Space Engineers, but we really wanted something that was much more systems oriented. But we were really struggling with the game loop. And if you look at uh, Stationeers, there was a, a real checkered history with making it. So did anyone hear about the game I announced? Well, the game that was not a game that was announced called Ion. So. Yeah, we, we announced a game called Ion, put a lot of money into it, and it sort of went nowhere, and then rebooted the Stationeers. So for those who've been following Stationeers, we're about to play a short video, which is just some development footage. Um, maybe if they, they roll this up now, and I can sort of talk over it. Um, so basically, uh, this is showing how some of, how, how basically you build these stations, and we decided we wanted to make them move as well, which has been quite interesting. But yeah, I think we're at a good point now, which is why we're here. So you can see in here, this is some of basically what's been built with the, um, with the mothership. So the idea of it is very space engineer style, you're placing the blocks down. There's a lot of welding in this video, by the way, which is actually quite accurate. And um, so, so we actually come up with the two grid system. Uh, the, the large grids you can see here, like welding the blocks, the engines are an example of two blocks. And then you actually connect everything all together with these on this on this small grid. And it's very much designed to be a multiplayer game. So you can see here, so you're watching someone welding, which is probably what you're going to do a lot of. Uh, has anyone here played a game called Barrow Trauma? A few yeah. people? Yeah. So it's, a, it's actually a free game. You can go look it up. I've spoken to the developer. Um, uh, he worked on a game, I think it was SC Containment Breach, Special Containment Breach or something. Uh, and it's a multiplayer game, very Space Station 13 based, where you're all on a submarine under the ice on Europa and you've got to go around. That's the broad game loop we're looking at for Stationeers at the moment. And we've been sort of hovering around the early access release for, a few, <laughs> for about six months now. But every, uh, we, we've really found like as we've gone along, the more we've tried, the more we've succeeded. So we wanted to do Voxel Terrain, which we did. Uh, we wanted to do some really cool pathfinding, which uh, Scott's got working now. Uh, basically, we've got space bugs. What are we calling them? Like? I think we just call them bugs. Yeah, Jim. I think he's called. Yeah. Jim, nice. And uh, yeah, and so you see here, you can see an example of the atmospheric system. Everything's threaded in the game, so the, uh, the performance is, is, is really good. So we're really looking at scalability. For those who've played a lot of space engineers and stuff like that, that was something that we wanted to try and do, maybe a little different. Uh, I know the um, CEO of um, Keen Software House, Mark, quite well, and I actually got to look at what they were doing. And yeah, so we wanted to try doing something different. Yeah, I don't know whether you want to talk about your time on the project a little bit before we start the questions. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, so the project's about a year old. Um, so Dean hired me straight out of uni, and we started on it, just me and him, for about three months. And we've only recently started sort of to upscale the team, so we now at about 12. And like Dean was saying, uh, the reason for the delays in the launch are because of our success. Like we don't want a small loop. We don't want a game that is, you know, people play for 20 minutes and that's it, and we burn out nearly access, which is what a lot of games are doing nowadays. We don't want people to be sort of yeah fizzled out on. We don't want to release a game with little content. So yeah, no, it's been interesting. We've had a lot of uh, not a lot of roadblocks, we've had some roadblocks. The main thing is sort of just testing our, uh, our ideas and make sure that they work before we take them to a larger scale. Yeah, but no, it's been, it's been a pretty full on year, for sure. So we, we had a lot of problems with our basic game loop. So trying to find like, what is that hook? How do you describe what the game is? And when we, were, when we had it about building just stations, so static stations, we did really struggle with that. Because you build up this station, and we didn't just want it that you just end up with never-ending big stations, so you need to add some level of risk in there. And then we had to describe what, we, what were you going to do. 
we are going to go off and do these away missions. How do you do that? You need something to get there. And that was where the idea of these motherships comes in, um, which you can see uh, in this game. I quite like that shot there of all the containers floating away because that pretty much always happens. Uh, so, um, yeah, the idea of, of, of the motherships is that actually when you start the game, you'll start off with this basic mothership and then you go off and you do the away missions to get better technology to build bigger motherships, add more stuff to it. So, so you saw the uh, engines in here. The engines are actually have to be powered by combusting gas. So at the moment, I think we're using, uh, well, we're using oxygen and pro propane. Um, so it's very king of the hill. But um, uh, yeah, we originally had uh, oxygen and hydrogen, but it just became too much of a pain having water because you burn oxygen and hydrogen, you produce water. And we were having trouble getting rid of the water and it was just making things annoying. So we were just uh, burning oxygen and propane. So you can see there the engines. And actually at the moment, we don't have a control system. So you have to control the burn manually. So you actually turn a little, uh, a little round uh, wheel that adjusts the pressure. And the actual combusted en energy is what energy that gets applied to the ship to move it. So you can see here, they're just about to start up. And the color of the, uh, the particles coming out is actually proportional to the clean burn. So if you see it burn in, in blue, uh, then it's actually uh, burning very efficiently. So that, so that was really the, the key aim was to explore. There's a lot of building and crafting games, but could we actually add a really you know, cool, broad element around it. Um, yeah, and yeah, so we're quite happy. I don't know if anyone had any questions. Maybe start coming up to the mics um, if you've got any questions about this or about Daisy and the development. So Motherships has really been, the, I guess, the big thing for us in terms of building that game loop. And the basic game loop that we're working towards now is essentially barrow trauma. Uh, so I really recommend people to go out and have a look at it. Is there anyone here who's played a lot of Space Station 13? Yeah, so, so I guess that's another key. I mean, that's the huge inspiration. So that started out, I played a lot of that. I made a modification of that called Rocket Station. And uh, that was the idea towards building um, ION, which we pumped you know, millions of dollars into uh, developing in London, and which was a failure. So I think we've got one question there. Uh, was that a, a G, uh, G mod build? It's build? Space build. Yeah. Um, no, I, I haven't heard of that one. Could you describe it a bit? Oh, it's basically like space engineers before space engineers, but there was a heavy um, influence on like the systems management and everything, kind mm -hmm. of leaving Earth to then go and explore. It was really crude and really broken. But I was just wondering, yeah, so you haven't had any influence from that? I mean, I've had a, definitely had inspiration from a lot of Gmod yeah. mods. Uh, the thing is, I don't know about anybody else with Gmod, but I'd end up playing it. I was too lazy to organize myself, so I'd just end up playing with friends, and they'd just be like, just get this or get that. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think definitely Gmod felt a lot like what we were doing, doing early on in Stationers. So there was a lot of just building stuff for the sake of it. And our IT director, J-Rod, who actually just came second in the New Zealand uh, Beard Awards, um, uh, he, he really liked just playing the game, just building stuff. But we really felt we needed more, and that's why we've continually delayed the launch, because so many other games have sort of just covered that territory. Uh, I, I feel like my the one thing I wanted more of from Space Engineers was that... Uh, you know, that system stuff, and then managing the systems with your friends, like, I don't know if you've played Pulsar? No, I haven't. Uh, so, so Pulsar had that, has anyone else played Pulsar? Yeah, it's like, kind of like Artemis, but not quite as nerdy. So that was a huge inspiration on Space Engineers as well. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I've played a lot of these sorts of games as well, and one of the things I keep coming back to is uh, necessarily, why am I building uh, these huge stations or ships? I was wondering if you could explain a bit more about um, your away missions and the sort of things you have planned. Sure. So like Scott was saying before, we've been kind of fluid with how we're making the game because we really just wanted to sort of find the fun and grab onto it. So we've, we've been experimenting and got quite a good system in place for planets. Um, and um, uh, we've been working on a system of instancing 
Uh, we're not too sure how that, whether this will be out for early access, but we've been basically developing it where when you start up a server for the game, you can define how many extra copies of the server that will run, and it will create little instances. So it's kind of like, say four of you that are playing in the game want to go off to this planet, you will actually disconnect from the server and connect to another local server as an instance and go off and do your away mission. And that means the calculations that are occurring in your world won't be affecting the other world. But for a start, we're really just going to push towards uh, where barrow trauma kind of is. So the away mission will be taking your mothership. So maybe you, you'll start with a little station and you'll have this mothership, but your mothership is restricted by the amount of blocks you're allowed to build. So you need to go away and do these missions. Say oh, one of the things we're thinking of is exploring an alien ruin. So there's this old alien base filled with insects and you go in and you shoot them and kill them um, and in your mothership you have most of the supplies you need for it so maybe some cryo tubes for healing people um, stuff like that but maybe the really more advanced stuff's at your station so you go off in your mothership you've got turrets you shoot the aliens then you go back to your station build it up repair your mothership and go away again I don't know do you have any more yeah. questions about the away missions specifically uh, yeah. or um I mean, yeah, that all sounds really cool. Uh, I think I guess. one of the key parts of it is to try and pull in a tech tree with the away missions. So, I don't know, have you played much Factorio? No. So, Factorio has quite a nice tech tree to pull you through it, but, but I feel like uh, Factorio has this awesome system. You, you know, you can build all these cool machines, but we really wanted to add a lot more reason why to build the machines. So who, who's played Factorio here a lot? So I felt like with the reactors, I wanted them to be more dangerous. So that was something we've been working towards uh, as we're designing nuclear reactors and stuff like that. As you progress through the tech tree, we want to expose you to more risk and more danger and stuff like that. Okay, cool. So like you have the risk of running them hot and having them overload. And... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the, the basic away missions we want to have in for December are really focused a lot around taking your mothership somewhere, doing a mission, and then going back. And then um, at the same time, we didn't really touch on it in the video, but we have uh, like fabricators, and you obtain recipes and stuff like that. So obviously, you go away, you do your mission, you get the recipe as a reward, you come back and you can build it. Uh, and then you know your fabricator may require so much pressure or so much resources, so you have to expand your mothership in order to sort of, you know, uh, yeah. Um, so would the progression be uh, individual based or like based on a group or a faction? Uh, yeah, we wanted to make the game, uh, so he asked about where the progression was like individual based. So we wanted to make the, gaze, the game very drop in or drop out. So you could basically just join someone's game and, and sort of just carry on. I felt like Space Engineers has achieved that quite well actually now. Um, you just set your, your game to friends mode and your friends can just drop, drop in. So the character that you create will be basically persistent to that world. Um, and we are struggling with this a little bit, how to basically with the instancing, how to, and we're looking at using Steam's inventory system so that when you're transferring between, we oh, sort cool. of sequence everything properly. But yeah, we, we also wanted to have a skill system on the players and talent system. Inspired quite heavily by Project Zomboid, I thought they had a really good talent and trait system where basically you select maybe a few good traits, but that means you have to select a couple of negative ones, like maybe your character's an alcoholic or a you know, drug addict or something. Or a clown. You're, or a clown, you know. You, you need to grow some space weed or something like that. Because I think that adds some real flavor uh, to the role playing, and we did kind of want to not push too hard on that, but definitely push towards it. Awesome. Oh, thanks. Cool, Thank thanks. You. Um, so I did play quite a lot of Space Station 13, and one of the systems that made it so engaging was they had a full atmospheric system where they kept track of every tile on the map, and as a result you'd have like gases flow from areas of high pressure to low pressure, so you could smash out a window and people would get sucked into outer space, and the people remaining in the room might suffocate, you could have poison gases slowly spread throughout an area, and it was a lot of fun, allowed a lot of opportunities for sort of gameplay, but it was also a, a massive performance hit, if I remember well, because that was a lot of stuff to calculate on a... It, was, it wasn't on a very good engine, it was on Beyond System, I think it was coded by a hobbyist. But, you know, with computing power it is today, and, you know, having to start from scratch, not an existing engine, I wonder if you've considered 
working on some sort of atmospheric system like that and uh, having to seal up your mothership and then pressurize it and then because it looks like the player character had a spaceship on uh, a spacesuit so we didn't have to worry about that but that's something that I don't know have you considered it yeah so we've actually got a full atmospheric serum uh, system in it um, and in fact not only do we calculate as atmospheres for all the squares um, we also calculate the atmospheres for everything inside. So I'll give you a good example, which has actually created a few bugs. Um, in order for the player to breathe, the player actually um, uh, pulls in their breathing atmosphere. Um, let's say they're not wearing their suit. They pull it in from the world atmosphere they're in. And the first thing that happens is it equalizes pressure with the lungs, which are six liters in the game. And then um, during the on-life tech, um, the player actually metabolizes whatever's in their lungs. So we're actually not only calculating the atmospheres all around the player um, and in the world, we're also calculating atmospheres inside, say, the air tank. Um, we're also doing full light calculation. So when the light hits a world atmosphere, it actually heats it up based on like the black body radiation, all that kind of stuff. So that created a lot of issues for us yeah. and we've refactored that a lot. But we do it threaded, which means um, we're taking a use of uh, multi-threading on a computer and stuff like that. So it's something I think we're very impressed with. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know when the, you saw the little jetpack working? Yeah. As it's jetpacking, you're actually, depending on what tank you put in your uh, jetpack slot, uh, by default it's a nitrogen tank, you're actually outputting that nitrogen to the atmosphere. So that means if you get lazy and you use an oxygen tank, um, we've had some incidents where basically you, you're in a really high oxygen or dangerous environment and your jetpack is firing oxygen and setting things on fire or allowing things to catch fire. So. Also, uh, uh, we had to change propane. I mean, sorry, not propane, hydrogen to propane because with such a realistic atmosphere controller we were getting like water that was being created when we didn't want water to be created, so things like that. So it's quite, uh, it's quite realistic and it, it performs well. Yeah, and we had to do the multi-threading. Then we had a second challenge that came with basically uh, applying that in a multiplayer sense. Um, so we had to write a basically occlusion system that um, on the server would decide whether a client should receive an update. So there's, there's essentially a network bubble around the player, and we only send atmospheric updates to the player, I think it's within 20 grid squares, and each grid square, large grid square, is two meters by two meters by two meters, and that defines a uh, atmosphere. Um, even works with voxels. So basically, the voxels I think are basically half a, uh, the one meter, one meter by one meter by one meter. So you have four voxels on a planet to one grid square, uh, and we did that deliberately so that that way you can't more than have uh, one atmosphere square. All right. And we're going to gonna, we're gonna use that for uh, voxel lakes and stuff like that because we've got full voxel-based uh, water, physical water in the game as well. Yeah. We also have um, a lot of our testers, uh, some of them are from Russia, so they don't have the best tech, and um, it seems to run fine on their, you know, Windows Vista computer. So, yeah, so, yeah it's quite, it's performance-based at the moment, and we still have a lot uh, to do if we need to, but, yeah, no, it, it runs well. And we really wanted to base it on uh, scalability, um, so that you can go around and create the stations and stuff like that. So yeah, and I guess in answer to your question, we have full, I would say um, as good as the best um, Space Station 13 variants. Like I actually did a lot of coding on Space Station 13 myself as well for various um, different servers. And um, you know, there's like uh, Linda and stuff like that is the, uh, was one of the early versions of um, the atmospheric system in Space Station 13. We're probably closer to that, but without the performance problems of it. Oh, excellent. And um, also in the video, um, we see him building the spaceship a cube at a time. Are there going to be scenarios where there's already a spaceship like ready to go, something large and fleshed out that you know people can just jump in and role play or interact, or do you have to you begin your session by building a spaceship and construction? Well, it takes first? so long to build now. Like um, even to build a basic airlock, you've got to place all the airlock doors. You've got to. Um, connect them all together, you then have to connect them to consoles, you have to put a mother uh, airlock circuit board in each of the consoles, you have to slave the, um, the other consoles to the master console, then you've got to connect that, uh, and the software in the console, get it to connect, to tell it which is the exterior and interior door. You also have to connect it to at least one active vent, um, you've got to connect it to a gas sensor, you can also connect it to warning lights, and that's just for the airlock. 
then you've got to connect the pipe to the active vent, then you've got to connect the pipe up to a pipe connector, and you've got to put a gas canister on it, and then you've got to, yeah. So it takes quite a long time. So our current plan, again, if, if you're interested in um, stationers, check out the game Barrow Trauma, because that's the basic game loop we're focusing on, but we really see that as only a small part of it. Yeah. Um, I think uh, if the game's successful, it'll be successful because of modding as well. So a lot of people maybe have been concerned in the community because we're not focusing on, say, remaking Space Station 13, but we're hopeful that will be possible based on the level of modding support. We're targeting sort of city skylines or Kerbal Space Programming level of mod support, so you'll be able to make DLLs um, directly, which basically overwrite how the whole game works. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, so far looks good. I was a big fan of Factoria too. Factoria's pretty cool. But uh, so in terms of what I want is from this game is interesting logistics challenge, right? So one of the things which I really loved about Factoria is that you had to lay out the game, but I think Factoria wasn't complicated enough. I need like this, but I really want depth, like literal that depth, something like that. So. And that airlock thing, like, oh, that sounds awesome. I want to build it now. <laughs> Give it to me. <laughs> yeah, but in terms of what to ex expect, so you mentioned you had, like, tag tree, right, with unlocks, right? I don't actually want that. I want to have better synergy between different gameplay. So uh, let me give you an example. So I played a lot of really complicated mod packs for Minecraft, right? So one Feed of the beast, them was, I guess, stuff like that. What? Feed the beast. Ah, no, more complicated. Wow, uh, big okay, infinite more tech guy. Yeah, so basically, what, so modpack creators, they actually worked with mod developers to create a really interesting synergy. So if you have a quest, right, it gives you an item to accelerate your progression and something else, right? But there's actually like one huge spanning tech tree, and you can get one way to like through like maybe 10, 12 branches, mm -hmm. right? And it's just all like comes back to that ultimate thing you want. And one thing which I really want to is like, so you build this mothership, but I want it to evolve naturally, right? So you start with like shitty yep. materials, like you just have like this crappy iron. Then you like maybe move on to like proper steel, stainless steel, uh, chromite steels, then titaniums, you know, like so there's really like spanning progression. And so ultimately you can like just build a giant hunk of spaceship, like, oh, there's alien spaceship, just crash it, who cares, your spaceship is cheap. Or you can like build very sleek, elegant, like very nice spaceship. Right? So once specifically what I want is like, so the challenge is like, not only that, but you can also be lazy about it. It's like, oh, I don't need good armor, I'll just stick more of it. Who cares that I'm slow? And I so, think that- like, Is it something that will be offered? Yeah, and I, I mean, I think that brings up a good point of what was quite important about motherships, as we were really struggling to get a game loop that you could sink your teeth into. Mm. So uh, that, the aliens in Factorio add quite a nice like counterbalance. When we play Factorio at work, we play it in what I call Mad Max mode. So we make oil really rare, but really high yield. So basically you have to go very long distances to find oil and build these really complicated train lines. I saw a, I think it was a Stationary Steam Forum post, someone asking about trains. I really want to add trains in some way to Stationary's. Um, to have reasons to go, you know, long distances. Uh, yeah, I mean, I played a lot of really complicated, well, I thought Feed the Beast was pretty complicated, but Minecraft, it's just, when my friends want me to play Feed the Beast now, like Mason and that, who's kind of our patron with Stationers, one of just this, like, he, he, he makes really complicated stuff in Stationers. Yeah, I mean, a good example of something we already have in the game is logic computers, and a logic computer allows you to basically make little state machines. So it uses a series of Boolean statements. So in a logic machine, you can make a rule and say, uh, define a series of conditions. So if this pressure sensor is greater than this and this device is on, then you do these things. So, so we wanted to do stuff like that. And I think the reason we were successful with, so far with stationers versus ion is we tried to keep everything in first person and everything in world. So you're really just always in the world dealing with stuff, and I think that's something that made Space Station 13 really interesting. So yeah, I'm hopeful we'll, we'll give you what you want at the risk of, um, I mean, we also have to consider some, I guess, gamey mechanics, and that's where I think the tech tree comes in. Um, and I, I think tech trees help you sometimes with the 
uh, maybe the people other than yourself who do need a little bit of a push in a direction, because there's a real danger, and I think Daisy suffered from this. If you want to compare Daisy with Battlegrounds, like Daisy was successful, but I mean, half of the people playing a Steam game at the moment are playing Battlegrounds. So why is that? And I was talking about this with Brendan before. I think a lot of that is because Battlegrounds has a really great like parameter around it. You know, the, the, the world shrinks and it gives you a very defined experience. And I think with Stationers, we do want to put a little bit of that in there. And, and I think a tech tree, you say, okay, well, what do you do in Stationers? Well, you start out with a small base station and a small mothership that we provide you. That, that'll be, I think, the default game start. That gives you and your friends something you just hop in and you can go do stuff. And then you go do these little missions and you might find a really special ship core that you can use to upgrade your ship so you can build a larger ship and stuff like that. Uh, we're definitely wanting to add things like tiers, like you know steel, titanium, but we're also very conscious on, we don't want to add a lot of fodder to the game. So you end up with things like, um, like, I don't know, there's 30 ores in the game and you need to find iron, but you can't find iron because there's uranium here. And so we'd really I, I think that's what this guy wants. I, I know the <laughs> Victoria mods you're playing, they're just too hardcore for me. I, I think um, we, one of the things we really wanted to do with Station is it's only one of the four projects and probably the least ambitious project we have at the studio at the moment, um, was really just to make something really robust. Um, for reasons um, many people probably sitting here will, will realise. But we wanted to make something quite robust, very focused on scalability and, and just a really good, fun title on early access launch. I think, hopefully, we'll build a platform where people will make the mods to do exactly what you want. Uh, so you mentioned you have, like, logic systems, right? Please add proper in-game programming. Come on. Yeah, so now there's a... There's space a, engineers did it garbage like yeah. it was just barely usable uh, so hey, you played space engineers right yeah uh, it's just, it was just nothing to do the game had no actual like end goal it's like look you have a spaceship what else and yeah so so one of the one of the challenges with the so they have multiple methods of programming one of the ones i really like doing was using timer blocks to make like what i called auto miners um and you also have a programmable block where you can actually write code in but, but we felt with Stationeers, we didn't want to take the player out of making the system. And, and it's something I really liked about Minecraft when you were doing Redstone systems. You were actually designing, and people designed like 8-bit computers using Redstone. So, so we really wanted to do that. And if, um, if you're interested, you can check out, we have the dev streams on the Rocketworks uh, uh, YouTube, which has a, has a series of playlists. And we go through making a logic computer uh, that runs the furnace. So basically it shuts down the furnace uh, if it gets too hot and it adds more gas in and stuff like that. And I think we're really only at the early points of what we want to do with that, mainly because we're focused on really robust gameplay with it. Oh, so the note is right. Uh, what I was referring to the space engineers having awful programming is the fact that they use C-sharp, but they cut out all the variable states. So you had True. to save state by renaming stuff, right? That was just stupid. Uh, what specifically I want is like maybe like proper LEA interpreter mm -hmm. in game, which can drive all the machinery, right? That's what Minecraft did already. Like if you if you have like uh, by the way, so in terms of tech tree, uh, I want something to refer to. So the way the uh, some mod packs addressed it is that they give you a quest book, which literally like have all the tech tree drawn out for you, and they reward you like, oh look, you get it, here you go. Now here's a small reward to help you out with the next tier. Yeah, so, I think, like, it doesn't actually lock. You can throw this quest book out and just do it yourself if you know everything. But yeah, literally, to I guide the player. If you make a, you can make a game where you just build stuff, uh, and that's kind of fun. And I think there's a lot of people who enjoy that, like J Rod, our second place winner, beard, uh, and the beard national beard winner uh, in New Zealand. So he he likes just making systems. And when we play Rocket Station, which was my mod for Space Station 13. Mm. He would build a, a turbine power generator, and he just got a sense of accomplishment just from building that. But I think for me, I want that context out of it, that why are we doing it? And so as we develop and add a lot of the systems you're doing, we're trying to test that against a sense of why are you playing it? And that was, what, that was something we searched for, and I think I never really felt like we found it with DayZ. And I think with all the games we're making at Rocketworks, we're trying to find that sense of context because I, I feel like 
particularly now more than ever in the game industry, if you don't have that, your game can really do very poorly. So yeah, it's it's a challenge. I definitely see where you're coming from there. The, the biggest thing we're testing against is how does that factor in? We don't want to make systems um, that you almost can just get around. So in Factorio, when you're uh, refining the uranium, you get some refined uranium. But later on, you just get this magical device, basically the centrifuge that you can just chuck it into that just makes your refined uranium. And I find with me, uh, I wish Factorio had more reasons why I had to design my own machines to solve problems. So a good example in stationing, uh, stationing is at the moment is um, when you build the engines, there's no system that allows you to control the engines. You have to manually control... That's why control. I want programmable. I want to make yeah, my you know, own system for actual yeah, flying Yeah, you have it. to write a computer for that. Now, we are going to make it a little easier, um, <laughs> but that's what we want. We want to have a whole bunch of systems that add that in. Thank you. Cool. It's too hard for me. That's no, all right. Um, I, I was just wondering, um, for some people that probably don't want to go to really complex, like, depths of how to, like, do really basic things, as a barrier of entry for some people like myself, I really don't mind saying that, um, will you have some kind of mechanic where it will be less min-maxing, more intuitive kind of, in kind of um, building the building designs and stuff like that? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good point, and I think it comes back to why we wanted to make this game. So um, uh, my sister, uh, Stephanie, she's actually our head of studio. She, she basically runs the studio. I'm just a, a person who gets pulled out occasionally to do things like this, but or, or try and encourage everyone to play video games. Um, so a good example is when we played Ark. We actually shut the whole studio down for several weeks to play Ark. And uh, we found that there was really big divergence in the type, type of people who wanted to play games. So we had some people like me. I really like role playing. So I just like making a little wood hut and going around and gathering food and just, just surviving, you know. And I really feel like uh, still haven't had a chance to really achieve that survival. And that, to me, is what interests me most in Station Ears. Just surviving, getting out in your suit, going outside, managing your oxygen, managing your food, managing your water and stuff like that. So, so we wanted that to be a key game loop of Station Ears. We actually, remember we drew, drew it up, the, the type of player who, who we felt made up a, a group. So we wanted basically you and about maybe five or more other friends to get together and, and each of you had different roles. Maybe two of you are really into making complex machines. But maybe two of you are just into finding the best colors to paint your, like, uh, your suits, you know? Because my sister just really enjoyed going around and, like, coming up with a standardized ARC uniform and stuff like that. And, and so I think that was what we wanted. We wanted some people maybe to be doing security, just going around and shooting stuff. Other people to be medical, more focused. Uh, some people just cooking uh, in the game. So I think... Um, the game, the idea of the game is not to be just hyper, like, Minecraft feed the beast on steroids, yeah. but actually to kind of bring together about five players. We want to support more. I think we've been having, like, up to 20 in our yeah. playtests, no problem. But we really wanted to design it around a group of friends, some of whom might be really into the hardcore gameplay, but that their more casual friends could just join and just play, just to have fun. Yeah, exactly. I think... I think, I think the one of the main reasons why my question really came to my head was you started bringing up Feed the Beast. Now, Feed the Beast, for people that don't know, is a pretty pretty good platform for Minecraft and there's a bit of min-maxing for those that are like, wait a second, I didn't read that one thing in that one book like 20 hours ago and I've totally forgotten what to do next. Like, there's that kind of sort of barrier for some people and I just thought I'd just bring it up. Well, I think for me, Left 4 Dead was a good example of a game where uh, you could kind of play it with your mum, you know? Like, you could have one or two people in your group who sort of carried everyone else if, if they just wanted to go in and have fun. And I think when we started, that was something we talked about quite a bit. Yeah, we also have things like, um, so you have the logic computer, so if someone wants to make a super custom system, they can, but then we also just have stock circuit boards, so you can just plug that in, and it does... Yeah, it does the base of what you want. Like, if you want to 
make it more in depth, then you have to go and you know get the logic computer out and make it how you want. But there are still for the people who just want to play. We've got you know circuit boards and things that give you the base the base entry to that kind of stuff. And I think that cuts to the core pillar of the game, which was it's fun to play alone. So we we felt it's actually probably going to be a very niche game, and we haven't really looked at whether it's going to sell heaps. And it's sort of pri- uh, I guess in terms of how we do the funding, it's we don't need it to be massively successful. And the idea was that, yeah, it's fun to play alone. So you might be playing it by yourself and then your friends just drop in to help you out building your station and stuff like that. Cool. So I'll try to be quick. Um, how you said having a group of friends and stuff like that going about what you were saying about you like just the role-playing aspect of it. Is there going to be any classes or skills that you can actually do and improve and then, yeah? Yeah, so one of the, this is, like, Space Station 13 is a round-based game, and I love it, I like it, but I, I feel like I wanted to see how that worked in a persistent basis. So if you look at DayZ, I think the reason that DayZ is successful, and I, I probably said this quite a few times, but I usually do this with my, with my car keys, like, hold up the Tesla car key, and I say, if this is your Tesla, if I say this is your Tesla for an hour, you're going to treat it very differently from if I say it's your t- Tesla forever, you know, your car or whatever, your phone. Um, And and I feel the same about gaming experiences. So I think that uh, what we wanted to do was see how having a persistent character affected you. This was for DayZ. And we wanted to apply the same thing with Stationeers. So as you play the game, your character gets better at doing different stuff. So whatever your class is and whatever talents you have. And, And I think Project Zomboid, I personally feel... Have you played Project Zomboid? So... I really like their skill system in that because you're trying to survive and you're trying to level up your like skill system and stuff like that, and it gives you a fear of losing your character, um, but not absolute loss when everything goes south and your character dies. And that was something that we're very interested in pursuing as well because basically your character dies. If your friends can recover your body, they can drag you to a cloning machine and clone you and you won't lose all your skills. But if you outright lose your whole body, you get cloned from scratch and you lose all your skills. So it means it's kind of that... uh, uh, So Tynan Sylvester, who wrote a book on game design, he's the creator of RimWorld, he talks about elastic failure, which I really like. It's kind of like if permadeath is black and white, elastic failure is about things being grey. So you don't have this catastrophic failure that makes you uninstall the game. Um, You know, it's kind Because that makes you problem solve more. And the second question that I have is uh, real-world applications or when you're designing this game, how much uh, are you drawing from the real world from all the um, technologies and um, breakthroughs we're currently making? Uh, I mean, we try to make it relatively accurate, but we're more concerned with consistency. Like, if something acts one way, it needs to act, you know, appropriately another way. Um, we are trying to make it it's a simulation game, so it's trying to relatively real, but to the point where it's not mundane real, like, you know, you're having to go to the toilet every hour and eat every, you know, 30 minutes and stuff like that. So it is, it's definitely based on realism, but to the point where it doesn't become frustrating. Yeah, and I think I, I've talked about before liking uh, authenticity more than realism because I think there's a challenge if, you, if you're trying to make a realistic game, you, you end up not making a game. You end up basically just uh, making something that, that's like super niche and, and, and doesn't even really have a good loop. And so I think, yeah, we're looking for that authenticity. So has anyone played a Minecraft mod called EnviroMine? A couple of people. So I loved EnviroMine. It's not updated anymore, which I think is a huge shame. It added hydration, sanity, oxygen, and a whole bunch of stuff like that to Minecraft, and I think that's been a huge inspiration for us. We haven't got uh, sanity and stuff like that in the game yet, but that's definitely a key loop for us, because it gives opportunities for role play. Um, you know, you're, you're out in your suit too long, uh, your hygiene gets lower, and you have a higher chance of having sickness. And the idea is to try and pull in systems that are familiar to the player from real life, and it gives opportunities for interesting interactions and stuff like that. Uh, do you have any plans for ship-to-ship combat? Yeah, so um, we didn't get to see it in the Mothership's reveal. I think we're going to start doing the live streams again. My old army injury played up, which is uh, how DayZ got created, but, and I had to have surgery, so we stopped doing the 
um, during the, uh, the live streams. So we, we used to do the live streams every Sunday at 1 p.m. New Zealand time, which I think would be like 11 a.m. or 3. Yeah, I think we're, yeah, we're here. Bored. We're forward. Yeah. <laughs> oh, time zones are hard. Um, so yeah, so, so basically I think next week I'll show off the turrets. Now the idea for the turrets for a start, rather than ship-to-ship -ship combat, is actually going to be ship-to-alien combat. Um, we, we weren't looking at making the game explicitly PvP, but we didn't want to make it not PvP. Uh, the reason being is that PvP introduces a lot of hacking problems. And for a start, at least I'm in an area of the country that's not going to make fun of, uh, area of the world that's not going to make fun of me for the way I say hacking. But um, so, yeah, so we weren't, we didn't explicitly want to focus on player versus player right now. Uh, mainly because of the security issues with it. We are actually doing most of the calculation server side, which helps us with that. But yeah, we were wanting to add big cannons to the game, and, and then you, you have to build conveyor systems to load the cannon, if you want, unless you want to run stuff in. Have you played Barotrauma? No. So definitely check it out. Barotrauma has a uh, sub versus sub mode, which is pretty cool. Um, where you're, you know, like each of you are like loading rounds into a submarine and stuff like that. It's very cool. So I don't think we want to explicitly support that, and hopefully, though, mods will make that more possible. I've played a lot of Space Engineers, and uh, one thing I've noticed is that the, the weapons that you're, that you're meant to use are less effective than things you can make yourself. Or if you build a torpedo that's just a big hunk of metal and throw it at someone else's ship, it'll obliterate it entirely. Yeah, I mean, Space Engineers has a level of fidelity that's enviable. Like, the planets are incredible. Like, the, uh, I just love them. But, um, and, and that's why I think with Station Ears, I, I'd always wanted to m make a game essentially like Station Ears. So, at, at, you know, ever since I first played Space Station 13, but we realized pretty quickly on that we wanted to focus on the systems. So, uh, and, and that means allowing you to find those those ways to make cool weapons. And you know, how can I solve this problem? How can I make a giant flamethrower in a ship and set another ship on fire and stuff like that? Also, oh, anyway. yeah. So I think, um, yeah, it's dangerous because you, you feel like you're just sort of promising everything. I'd say definitely our focus is more on PVE, and we're hoping to leave the PVP more to modders. Um, just because I think we need a core of the game that's fun and enjoyable that people want to play, particularly as a, as a niche game. And then we're sort of hopeful that, um, that if, if Stationers was to go bigger than our expectation, it would probably be because of the workshop support that we're putting into it, so like when, KSP and stuff When you like. say PVE, do you mean that there will be like, like enemy NPCs that are, like, have their own specific way they work, or will it be more like you fight automated enemy ships? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, about so uh, at the moment we have some sort of alien bugs which work on some like A star pathfinding. It's sort of like a swarm AI. So okay. they work like bugs. They follow. Well, eventually the goal is to follow the queen and stuff like that. Um, we haven't really. So they're like the the low level primitive AI. But we are planning on adding in people who can fly spaceships. Um, the other AI we're wanting to add in is things like prisoners and uh, what was it like a hospital? So things like that. But yeah, we're really sort of focused on rounding off the core systems before we kind of expand on new ones. Mm. Because it would be neat to like take advantage of like a flaw in an enemy system to then like set their ship on fire, make it explode or something, put fuel into their hull or something like that. Yeah, I mean the one of the big challenges we have has probably been how to how to get you know close off the game loop. So we've been kind of focused on that. Adding on to the barotrauma, sort of get in your mothership and go somewhere. The idea was maybe you're going somewhere because you're transporting prisoners. So the first AI we wanted to bring in was prisoners. Mm -hmm. So kind of like prison architect, but you're doing it in a prison ship and taking prisoners from A to B. And the prisoners are AI. And then we can apply the same sort of uh, rationale to patients. So. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're taking patients from A to B and maybe you have to do surgeries from them. Then expanding them, like Scott says. But we also have, like, what, what dangers do you face on the way? And at the moment, there are these ants um, that run around on the planets or flying ants that, like, attack your ship um, in space and stuff like that. Yep. Cool. So I think we're, uh, we're pretty much just about done, but... Um, yeah, we just wanted to thank everyone for coming along. So uh, uh, we're looking at basically launching uh, stationers in December and early access. 
We won't hesitate to delay it, uh, and we've been delaying it all uh, all year since basically since about June. Um, basically, until we're really happy with a really solid core game loop. Yeah, we really, uh, really don't we, want people burning out in early access. Yeah, but we're pretty confident about the December um, the December release, uh, and it's really important sort of morale mm. for the team because basically once we get the game in people's hands, it starts to help us test our assumptions about what's fun and what's not, and where the game should go. So yeah, thanks everyone for.